All right, good morning, everybody. We good? Yep. All good here. All good. You guys can see my screen, all right? All right, well, we've had a terrific couple of days, and we're going to bring it home this morning with a couple more sessions. Uh, this is always one of the highlights of our, uh, of our summit, and that's our, what, we, what we call our alumni professional panel. So everybody you're going to meet here are alumni of uh, the University of South Carolina. They all have great backgrounds and, and stories to tell, and that's a little bit of what you're going to hear today. Um, don't be afraid as we kind of go through to, to chat your questions or comments, and we'll keep an eye on that, and we'll try to answer as much as we can as, as we go through this. We really want this to be as, as conversational as possible. So I know a number of you, as I look at the names kind of down the list, joined us yesterday uh, for a couple of the sessions, but just as a, a quick reminder, uh, this is our, our fifth annual CMO Summit, um, and we've deemed this one Marketing's Moment. Um, and really learn, knowing how to, learning how and, and, and actually competing in, in a time of disruption. And disruption is one of those words that's used a lot these days, but, uh, and it can mean a lot of different things. But truly, we do believe that it's marketing. Marketing as a discipline is going to be in the forefront for many companies of how they navigate these, these uncharted waters and the changes that are happening all around us at the macro level as well as at the micro level. So, um, you know, we can't do that. The university, this is a university wide event. We have people of all different backgrounds. Um, and, you know, I, if, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jeff Railing. I'm on the marketing faculty here. Uh, I kind of champion this effort. It's kind of, in addition to teaching my, my role is to serve as the uh, director of the center for marketing, which is an outreach effort here at the school. And one of the things that's at the top of my list related to the center is trying to find new and different ways to connect our students to the marketplace. Uh, and actually, it's not just our students, it's us as well as faculty. There are a number of faculty joining us this morning. Um, and this is one of the events that also helps keep us honest in terms of are we teaching the right things? Are we keeping the market at the center of what we do in terms of the classroom and preparing our students to be the next generation of leaders um, kind of going forward? So the summit has become our showcase event for the marketing discipline. Um, it's grown every year, as you can see down at the bottom. Uh, this year, we had over 300 uh, registrants, and uh, I think last year we ended up about 270 or something like that. So it, it's grown every year and, and kind of taken on a life of its own, and, and we're, and we're going to continue that momentum uh, heading into the future. So um, we've got two, our last two sessions are today. Uh, we've got this one here, which is our executive panel, um, all alumni, as I said, and then we're excited at 11 o'clock, we're going to have Joe from Chick-fil-A here talking about uh, disruption and how Chick-fil-A has navigated that space. And of course, we all know uh, what a great brand and what great marketing um, the Chick-fil-A as a company does. So we're going we're gonna to hear from a variety of industries this morning, and it's going to be, I think, really interesting. I know I'm excited to, to talk to everybody as well. And so there are not many rules here other than um, if you get kicked out or something happens, we're, it's the same Zoom room all day. Uh, we have had issues with folks uh, with the links not working. Typically, if you copy and paste it, that'll get you in. It's a little clunky. I'm sorry about that, but um, that's kind of how it's worked. Keep your, your mics on, on uh, mute, if you would, um, except for the panelists, just so we can keep that background noise to a minimum. Chat your questions. I'm going to keep an eye on it as we're going. I'm going to facilitate this session, um, and I'll, I'll absolutely try to get to you. You can pull yourself off mute and, and ask questions as we go. And as I said uh, before each of these sessions, for years, I've challenged myself every time I sit through one of these to write down four things or capture four things that either made me think differently or that I didn't know or that maybe something I could do better or, or different. And so challenge yourself to not just you know, sit back and listen, but actually listen in a thoughtful way that says, what can I, what can I take away from this? What can I do different kind of going forward? Uh, and I've got a book where I keep all those things from all the different speakers I've heard over the years. And I think it's a great way to just kind of stay engaged and keep pushing yourself to learn, right? Because we all should be um, lifelong learners. So as I said earlier, um, disruption, right? Um, hard, it's hard to read the Wall Street Journal any day and not see some company, some marketer, some industry that's not claiming to be disrupted or doing the disrupting. We're going to talk a little bit about that in terms of our, our uh, alumni here, in terms of where, where they see themselves as a, as a company and what that kind of means to them as marketers. So we're going to get into that and you can kind of see what the definition of it is, is, is here. So I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this discussion in both these sessions this morning, that uh, so much has changed for us uh, in the last several years, certainly the last 18 months. 
Uh, and we, you, you can't turn on the news or read a newspaper or look at a blog and not see something that's, that's changing in front of us. And it's a marketer's job to stay in front of that. Uh, and that's a lot of what we'll talk about here in the, in the coming hour or so. So very proud to have these five uh, folks here, um, all proud USC alumni, as I, I said earlier. Uh, Amanda from Lionsgate, I'm going to let them do their introductions in a minute. Ken from Cox Automotive. Uh, you may not know the, the, the company Cox Automotive, but I bet you know a couple of their brands, and it's going to be interesting to hear about that. Chris is the, has had executive level marketing and sales roles at Fisher Price. That's another brand you guys all know. Also proud to call him now a colleague because he just joined us here at the University of South Carolina starting in August. So um, he's, he's actually giving back to students now. Maria has been a friend of the center and, and me for years uh, up at Continental Tire, one of our corporate partners that we do projects with. And finally, Last but not least, Terrence, and I, I, not only did I put these alphabetical, but I also wanted to get to, to Terrence last. So I said, this is our fifth annual CMO Summit. Um, the very first one started with Terrence and I, right, Terrence? Um, Absolutely. And Terrence reached uh, through a mutual contact at Forbes. Terrence had connected with me and we said, hey, Jeff, we should do this. And, uh, and so it, how we got here today is in large part to Terrence pushing me to say this is something we should do at the University of South Carolina. So Terrence, thank you for that. I you know, hope you're as proud as I am of what this has become over the last few years. So um, with that, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, and I'd, I'd like to start with uh, just doing introductions. And as you do introductions, you know, let's keep them relatively short. Two, three minutes is fine, something like that. But go back to, you know, kind of pre-USC uh, days, but then how you got to USC, what USC meant to you, how you got started in your career, what was that first job kind of out of college, and then kind of quick, quickly how you got to where you are today um, and kind of what you're responsible, what you're responsible for today. So um, why don't we, we'll do ladies first. Amanda, you want to kick us off? Sure, happy to. Um, I think that uh, without knowing each of the panelist stories, I think what you find is a constant theme uh, whenever you hear people talk about their path is, uh, I'm a big believer of the career lattice versus a ladder, and there's a lot of twists and turns that a career can take. Um, in my case, I am from Irmo, uh, which is outside Columbia, and uh, went to Irmo High. I uh, pursued a degree in print journalism at the University of South Carolina, and my first job out of school was actually at uh, the Free Times, uh, where I was an investigative reporter for a couple of years. And I did some uh, film reviews for the paper Moonlighting as well, and really wanted to continue to write. But I had a passion for film, and I wasn't really sure where to take that. And uh, in assessing what my options might be, I, I really fell in love with the idea of pursuing screenwriting. So I went to uh, UCLA um, to really attend their professional program. They have a year long program that kind of sits in between uh, their uh, continuing education office and their MBA office. Uh, so it's a certificate, but it's all the same professors they teach at night and it's, it's a full year instead of two. As I was uh, in school for that, I met my husband and he was in school to be a music producer. And uh, we looked at each other and realized one of us should have benefits and a paycheck. And so uh, I ended up uh, kicking around uh, what I could do in film that would combine what I enjoyed about being a journalist, which was the research and uh, really the strategy side of things with the creativity of screenwriting and uh, I decided to look at marketing as a career. And I knew if I was gonna do marketing that I wanted to do it in the film industry. And so uh, after a couple of different jobs um, in different agencies and organizations, I ended up at Lionsgate. Um, I've been at the studio ever since in a variety of roles, which I will not enumerate here, but uh, my most recent position is uh, really heading up our data strategy and innovation initiatives for the studio, which is uh, an interesting job uh, in a time of heavy disruption, which we will talk more about. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, and and Amanda's also uh, with Lionsgate has been a terrific partner of ours. We've been doing projects in our marketing scholars course under Mark's direction for 
several years now. What are we up, Mark? Maybe up four or five years now. Uh, so uh, thank We're you. Amanda. Starting our seventh year, Jeff. Uh, geez, it time flies, doesn't it, Mark? It does. Uh, well, Amanda, thanks for your partnership as well, and that it's been terrific experiences for our students. Um, all right, speaking of projects, we've got one going on with Continental Tire right now. Maria, you want to go next? Sure, yeah. Thank you very much, and thanks for the chance to, to be a part of this. I think it's really great um, to be able to, to talk with the students and to, to have a conversation with each other. So that's right. So it has been my dream for a few years now to connect uh, the, the University of South Carolina with Continental Tire and the umbrella of a marketing project. And finally, this year, we made it, and we're doing a fantastic project, actually, on data analytics, which is my space or kind of one of my areas of expertise. So just to share a little bit about myself. So um, I actually have, um, uh, my family moved from, from Greece in the late eighties. So I have this multicultural sense since, since very, very early on. I was born and raised in Thessaloniki in Greece and then my family moved. And I always knew going into university that I wanted to do something that had to do with internationalism or diversity. and. Um, I went to the South Carolina Honors College and got my degree in French and marketing. And then um, I, I knew about the MIPS program and I was, I was really um, always had my eye on it. And when I, when I landed there, I really felt like I was beside such like-minded people. So I felt like I was home since then. And honestly, when I joined Continental Tire, I had that same feeling. And that's the story I tell the colleagues sometimes um, is that I had this feeling of being part of a really international um, family, let's say, which is my work family. So um, I, I started uh, with Continental in 2005. So I've been with them for 16 years. Before then and after graduate school, so I graduated right shortly before 9-11. So um, very challenging time to, to find a job and, and all of that. I started working as a corporate trainer for a wireless telecommunications carrier. And then what I even shared in, in some of the panels a couple of nights ago is that I think I was able, there were a lot of transferable skills that I, that I learned in that job and was able to carry that over into my experience at Continental. So I started doing uh, a role that in Conti is called market intelligence, which is um, strategy, it's a market research role. It was a great entry point into the company um, as uh, it's a very engineering focused, very numbers driven uh, manufacturer. And uh, I started there. And then today, I mean, I've also had several roles, all of them in one way or another related to uh, data analytics and uh, market intelligence and strategy. And Today, I'm responsible for strategic marketing for North and South America for uh, the tire part or the tire division of Conti. So i um, really happy to be here with you and to, um, yeah, to share experiences and also hear questions and, and all of that. So I think that was it. I hit all the, the four points. And USC for me, I mean, I, I, we are a family of Gamecocks in my family. So my older sister, my younger brother, my niece, we, um, we've been part of the USC family since forever. So. Well, thank you, Maria. That's great. Uh, that's a perfect segue, I think, from, uh, from tires over to, to cars, right? Ken, you want to go next? Absolutely, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, I kind of feel like the elder statesman on this panel. I think I probably am the oldest one here. I graduated from South Carolina in uh, 1984. Um, my path to South Carolina, I grew up in uh, the Northeast and I was born in Boston, grew up in Connecticut and Ohio, but my dad was in sales and um, got transferred when I was in high school and we ended up in a small town outside of Charlotte. Uh, across the South Carolina border, Clover, South Carolina, which is near Rock Hill, and uh, ended up at uh, USC. Uh, graduated from the journalism school with advertising, uh, PR degree, and a minor in marketing. Um, and, you know, I got to say, my time at South Carolina, I look back on with great pride. I met my wife there. Um, we've been married for 32 years. We met as, as, uh, as teenagers our freshman year in, in the Russell House. Um, and my journey has been to a CMO has been really rather remarkable. So I'm honored and humbled to, to be with you today. Um, my career has spanned over 30 years, obviously. 
Um, but most of it has been was in telecommunications. I was at Sprint, uh, Bell South, AT and T, and Cox Communications, and kind of lived through the heyday of um, long distance and the internet and and um, video and everything that is uh, we all take for granted, including mobility and the technology that we're using today. Wide variety of marketing, um, sales, and product roles, uh, much like Amanda. I won't go into all of those. First job, though, was an event planner, uh, and I have some advice for, for you on your first role. Um, in February, I took a giant leap out of and went out on a limb and, and, um, and entered the world of automotive, which is, so it's a whole new industry, whole new set of customers, whole new team. Um, and uh, doing that during a pandemic has been rather challenging, um, but I am the CMO for Cox Automotive, which is a seven and a half billion dollar division of Cox Enterprises. Um, we are we are we're a pretty quiet company. We are a 120 year old um, company, family owned, fourth generation uh, is leading the company now. Alex Taylor, um, diversified company. Um, with holdings in communications um, on the cable side, um, as well as in clean tech, um, and also uh, emerging into esports is an area that we're investing in, in addition to, to automotive. We're about a $21 billion company based here in Atlanta. Um, and um, it really is a very special place with an incredible culture. Um, and uh, I look forward to sharing some of my experiences with you. So hopefully that uh, gives you a little bit of my background. Yeah, terrific, Ken, thank you. Uh, well, I'll stick with these really poor segues. Terrence, it's your turn. Somebody's got to insure those cars. I, I like what you did there. You went from tires to cars now to insurers. <laughs> That's because I can't figure out how to go to toys, but we'll get Well, we'll done. Get... <laughs> <laughs> well done. All right. Uh, hey, uh, good morning, everyone. First, I'm really honored to be here with you again. I, I missed the last year, but it's always good to be at this event. So, Jeff, thanks for the invitation um, for this one. So I'll try to be brief and keep it very high level from a background standpoint. My journey has been somewhat unique. Uh, over the last 31 years. So Ken, you may have, I think you did, you beat me in a few years as far as when you left USC, uh, but I've been in the insurance industry for over 30 years as well. And insurance is what I know. So I actually grew up in a small town right outside of Charleston. Uh, so small town, so when I'm talking to South Carolinians, I say, well, I'm from Ridgeville, but when I'm talking to someone else, I say I'm from outside of Charleston. Uh, but I was led to USC because of the insurance program. Uh, I made a decision somewhat at a young age that I wanted to pursue a career in the insurance industry. And back then in the 80s, there were only a handful of schools that had insurance programs. Uh, and USC was one of them, uh, just an incredible um, insurance program at the Moore School. So that's how I ended up at USC, literally. And, and over the last 31 years, I have worked for three insurance companies. Um, one of them you would have never heard of because it no longer exists. I uh, spent 20 plus years uh, at Nationwide in the last two years at Allstate. And now, during those 31 years or so, um, you know, I'm always honored to be on the screen with all of these true marketers because I'm really an operator who kind of pretends to be a marketer. Um, you know, I grew up and started in claims. I've worked in underwriting and product uh, and strategy and innovation. So I've done a lot of different things. Uh, and I was a CMO at Nationwide for a number of years. Uh, now, my current role, I have accountability for all of sales uh, within the Allstate umbrella, uh, and that is in uh, Canada and in the United States. So if you see one of the many blue Allstate signs in your neighborhood, uh, that is likely an agent or a company store uh, that rolls up through me. Uh, or if you're in Canada, you see the same thing. Uh, one of the things that we're focused on is fun trying to find ways to evolve how we connect with consumers. Uh, and I definitely would like to get into that more later about what that really means and how consumer expectations have evolved and shifted uh, and what it means as a salesperson, as a marketer, as, or as a young person starting a career. So thanks and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Terrence. All right, last but not least, Chris, bring, bring us through this one. What happened to my segue from, uh, from I was, Terrence? I was, I was trying to think of what, how I could do that, but I, it's still early. Uh, you could say something like, you know, insurance and uh, Fisher Price starts off with an insurance of fun. A fun childhood. All right. All right. So, uh, name's Chris Pardee. Uh, my uh, experience with USC is a great one and really a full circle. 
Um, I'll talk about how I got here. I grew up in Rochester, New York, which was the headquarters of Xerox, Kodak, and Bausch and & Lomb. Uh, talking to a lot of executives, they always said, uh, go into sales and then transition into marketing. So I kind of set that as my path. But originally, uh, I was good at math and science and thought I'd go to Clemson because I had an uncle that lived in Greenville. And he said, come here and uh, do some internships. I thought that'd be a good idea, be an engineer, and I uh, went and toured Clemson, and on Saturday, I came down to South Carolina to take a look, too, and it was homecoming. There was a lot going on on McBride Quad with all the fraternity parties and everything else, and I said, you know what? Engineering doesn't seem like that much fun. I'm coming to business, and I want to drive things, and so I ended up here and uh, never looked back, um, so I was here from 85 to 89. And my senior year, I was in a personal selling class where a uh, professor inspired me to kind of pursue and reassured the, the career in sales. So I started a career in sales with uh, Eastman Kodak, but he set my mind, maybe someday I'd like to come back and, and teach here at University of South Carolina. So uh, moved to Ohio with Kodak, sold high volume copiers. And like they said, start that and then go back into marketing. So I went back, got my master's uh, at Ohio State um, and then was recruited out of Ohio State to join Fisher Price and uh, Started in marketing, uh, worked my way up from marketing assistant to the, the VP of marketing and, you know, was there on the marketing side for, I guess, about 22 years. Uh, launched brands like Imagine X and Rescue Heroes from ground up. And what I liked about and what kept me there was the diversity of experience, working on TV shows, producing movies, uh, focus groups, international travel, and it, it kept learning. So I stayed there. And then I was in Vegas and I was walking with the president of the company and he said, with some salespeople and they said, welcome to the sales team. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And they all kind of giggled. And a couple months later, I was uh, on sales calling on Toys R Us. I put them out of business. Um, and so they moved <laughs> me over to uh, Costco, Family Dollar, Dollar General. And uh, my last role was in sales. I headed up the Fisher Price sales team calling on Walmart. Uh, and, you know, sales Good. analytics, customer marketing people on that team as well. So uh, that's my story, but glad to be back. So I found this opportunity and came back and now I'm sitting in Darla Moore and thrilled to be here. Oh, nice. All right. Well, thank, thank you all. Let's, um, let's get into the, the idea of disruption real quick here. Um, I'm going to ask a two-part question, but let's answer them one at a time. So we'll go through everybody for the first one, then we'll go back through. It'll give you a chance to think about it uh, for the second part of the question. So as I said earlier, earlier our overall theme for this event is uh, marketing's moment, uh, the critical role, role that marketing plays in an era of disruption and, and everything that is around it right now. And when I think about disruption, I think about it could be technology, it could be new competitors, it could be new business models, it certainly COVID supply chain issues, ice storms in Texas, right? Innovation and new products. Disruption can come from a lot of different directions. And, I, and honestly, let's not lose, lose sight of, could come from great marketing too. You know, maybe somebody markets very, very differently or, or whatever. As you, as you think about your business, your, kind of your industry and your business specifically, where do you, how are you seeing disruption? Are, do you see yourself as the disrupted or the disruptor or maybe some combination of both? That's kind of the first question. And then the second question will come back around, and I want you to think about it and, and talk about what that means to you as a marketing leader. How are you having to change the way you approach marketing? How are you, the way you're having to change how you approach your job um, and kind of what it means? So let's start with kind of the industry company side first, and then we'll go to kind of the CMO role and, and that leadership role that you guys are all in and what that means to you. So um, Terrence, you want to roll with the first uh, with the uh, the first part of that? talk about the insurance industry and, and Allstate for a minute? I will. I will. Um, it, it's interesting when you think about what's happening within the industry as a whole in my business, um, when you understand the number of insure techs that are literally entering the insurance industry, and when you think about the ease and convenience that's been created by technology, and I often talk about the Amazon effect and how it's had uh, just significant impacts on all of us, on regardless of your industry. And the reason why that's so important is because consumers now 
have expectations that differ from what existed 10 years ago. Uh, because I can, I can literally two clicks and there's coffee on my doorstep in a few hours, literally. So because of those changes, customers now uh, want and expect an ease and a convenience and a personalization that didn't exist many years ago. And the insurance industry is not immune from that. And that's why so many startup insure techs now are entering the space. You have literally billions of dollars being invested in that space that are driving uh, investments in technology, trying to create easy pathways for consumers to understand how to buy protection. So within my organization, within my company, what we're trying to do is, is reframe how consumers think about our industry and really shifting it away from a, a product per se, whether it be an auto product or an insurance product, uh, homeowner product, et cetera, and thinking about it through this lens of protection. Um, and if you think about it through the lens of protection uh, and really trying to convey how do you create peace of mind, how do you create a well-being within the consumer so that they don't feel um, threatened or at risk in the event, unlikely event of an accident or a loss or a significant tragedy or event. Um, and then broadening that to things well beyond just your typical auto insurance. So, you know, what, what's often unknown, unfortunately, for all states is that we offer all types of protection. You know, I picked up my phone a few moments ago um, and because everyone literally has a small computer in their, in their purse or in their pockets all the time. And, and these, these small computers cost hundreds of dollars and how do you find ways to protect it? So offering cell phone protection is something that's critical. How do you offer protection for your ID, for your identification, your personal data? How do you offer protection as a warranty for something that you buy, whether it's a refrigerator or a set of tires from Continental? Um, these are all things that, that we now do and offer and trying to shift the thinking with consumers around uh, this notion of protection is what we're trying to drive uh, to, to actually ensure we are ahead of many of the insure techs that are entering our space because their sole uh, means of differentiation is ease. Um, and now one of the things I often say is we have to find ways to meet consumers where they are, as opposed to pulling them to us. How do we meet them where they are uh, and differentiate and personalize to connect with them? Uh, so those are some of the things that are underway within my organization, but more broadly speaking, I think disruption is here to stay. This isn't a something that's happened over the past decade that eventually will evolve and slow down and the pace will change. Uh, I believe that disruption is here to stay. So organizations and companies that find ways to continuously remake themselves, continuously evolve, and continuously find ways to meet customers in new ways, in my, in my thinking, those are the brands and the companies that will continue to exist um, many, many years from now. And those who opt not to play in that space, they won't be around. Uh, just as the very first company I worked for right out of USC uh, no longer exists. So I'll pause there because I know there's lots of good thoughts from the panel on this subject because it's a broad, hot topic. Yeah. Thanks, Terrence. Uh, Ken, how about you? <clears throat> um, the automotive industry is really on the precipice of enormous change. And the interesting thing is that it is an industry that has historically been very resistant to change when you think about the traditional auto dealer. And we're really on a collision course between technology and automotive, which is, is good for me because I do it with that experience on in technology and communications, I can bring that over to the automotive industry. But it really is gonna change the way we buy, sell, and use cars in the future. Um, Cox Automotive, and again, just really quickly, again, you probably as, as uh, Jeff alluded to, probably not that familiar with us, but brands you may be familiar with that we have, Although my research would say that um, for the students, they probably are not aware of my brands um, because we're not very strong in millennials and in Gen Z. Um, uh, is Auto Trader and Kelly Blue Book are two of the most visible brands that we own. Uh, and then we also own a brand uh, that's Mannheim, but that one's a little bit more industry related, but we're a family of about 26 different brands. Um, and we're in a unique position that in many of those brands, we are the hunted. We are the one who has potentially going to be disrupted. So we spend most of our time ensuring that that is not the case. 
and looking for opportunities where we can be the disruptor, entering new market segments and shoring up our core services to kind of combat the competition because the competition is extremely fierce and they're, they're coming with technologically advanced solutions for the dealers um, to kind of transform um, how they go to market. Um, and, um, you know, for us, disruption is coming in the form of digital uh, and e-commerce um, and uh, digital wholesale and how co cars are moved between dealerships from a wholesale perspective. Both of those um, are on a fast path to, to Terrence's point, uh, how do you meet the customer in the channel of choice? Um, and um, most people, and again, the pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation in automotive by we think at least five years um, as far as how customers want to engage with dealers and the, their desire to do most more of the transaction or all of the transaction online. Um, and then the other form of disruption that's going on in automotive is what we call mobility. And that is not um, the cell phone that you carry around in your, in your pocket. Mobility in the world of automotive is code for fleets uh, and EV. There's a term in our industry called ACEs, and it's kind of the future of automotive. And ACEs is autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. And those four drivers are really going to, to disrupt the automotive industry. Fleets, just, just as a quick example. So Terrence's cup of coffee that he alluded to that could be delivered within two hours, that's a fleet that is delivering that. And how do those, um, how do those fleets get serviced? How do um, they get managed um, is a big area of growth for us. So we're kind of skating. The puck is headed towards digital and it's headed towards uh, EV. And uh, we have every intention of being a leader in those two spaces as they evolve over the next 10 years. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> Amanda, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I, I will um, let most of my panelists have, have the majority of the time because I think one of the benefits of entertainment uh, and movies and TV in particular is that uh, I don't have to tell the students too much, right, about how this area is being disrupted. We spend a lot of time listening to, to people like them uh, to tell us, right, how they're watching content, um, what kind of content they want to consume. Uh, I would say that what's probably pretty consistent across all the panelists is that I don't know that you spend all your time as a company or even a division being the disruptor or the disrupted. I think it's a constant cycle, right? Where sometimes you're mobilizing earlier, sometimes you're responding quickly, sometimes you're responding because you decided to wait, right? And, and really make sure that um, you could see which way the wind was gonna blow ultimately. And I think all of those are a necessary part of a company's strategy. Uh, to navigate this kind of an environment. Um, I agree with what Terrence was saying, which is that we are likely going to continue to see this uh, pace of change continue or even speed up, uh, which is requiring companies, uh, including ours, right, to, to really make sure that we're uh, operating efficiently, right, that we are um, engaging in nimble decision-making, uh, so if you take the pandemic uh, as an example, uh, when people were stuck at home and uh, we knew that there was a dearth of content that was available to them, we mobilized quickly to uh, have some sales to streamers. So there is a movie called Run that was on Hulu that was originally intended for theaters from Lionsgate. Uh, it was part of many titles that uh, ended up getting um, uh, made available on streaming instead and was very popular on that service. Uh, we also saw our library content uh, really drive up in terms of home entertainment transacting. Now we're seeing that uh, the theatrical market right, is, is really continuing to wake back up. And so we are looking to support that um, while also uh, you know, seeking the opportunities that are available in the new environment. So I think it's, it's a lot of um, kind of like uh, juggling right, all of these uh, different considerations and weighing uh, what the consumer is telling you against uh, what your product has to offer and, and finding where you can make a good fit. Good. Thank you. Chris. All right. I'm going to 
build off of what uh, William and Ken talked about uh, a little bit. So um, we talk about uh, digital disruption was one of the topics mentioned, right? And Terrence mentioned that his company that he started with is really no longer in existence. And I will tell you that Eastman Kodak, where I started, is basically no longer in existence. And why? Because they were disrupted by the digital world. They reacted slowly by not looking at their competitive landscape. They looked at their landscape as film and ignored the digital market. And they were one of the first into digital markets. So if you are disrupted, you have to become a disruptor and take advantage of it. And I'll give an example of where digital has also interrupted uh, Mattel and consumer packaged goods company, right? We know that when you look at kids today, you watch, what are they doing? They're on the phones. You see two-year-olds with iPads, everything else. And that cuts into time taken away from toys. But how do you then take advantage of that, right? You create content. You build YouTube channels. If you look at Barbie, I believe Barbie has... Uh, 10.7 million followers on YouTube and 15.2 million followers on Facebook. Hot Wheels has 3.3. We created Fisher Price uh, channels, right? And then I would talk about, so you have to go and uh, Ken talked about meeting your consumer where they are. That's what you have to do. And that's a marketing person's job, right? And then I'll talk about the, uh, the Amazon effect, which is also in a digital, changing the uh, competitive landscape on retail, right? And I think marketing and sales are converging as a result of this, right? When I was first at Fisher Price, you put uh, an item, you got a listing, you put it on TV, uh, and you hoped, and that was planned six months in advance. Now, marketing comes to the salespeople and says, hey, I need placement on digital shelf, talk to Walmart, talk to your account. How do we spend money on digital promotions on their website? So marketing and sales are converging as a result of the uh, digital disruption. And I think you, you need to be both aware of how you can do both. And when you are disrupted, what's your reaction to it? Otherwise you will end up out of business. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Maria. Yeah, I think it's a perfect lead and I mean, listening to everybody, um, I can only say that um, when I, uh, we're, I think that, I think Ken, you, you said it, the automotive industry is really on, on the cusp or even I would say really in the middle of, of disruption. So uh, my perspective, when I came out of the, the telecommunications industry in 2005, it was a very fast moving industry and it was uh, shortly before that um, the company RIM basically had launched the first Blackberries. And then when I joined Continental and I started looking into the market, market figures and industries, uh, relatively a pretty mature market, um, the tire market growing at about one to 2% a year. So really a different pace than what I was used to. And now fast forwarding to 2021, I would say everything has changed. There, there's so much that has changed with technology on the one side being at the very center of um, this disruption um, with uh, things like uh, connected tires that we see or electric vehicles where we've seen that, especially in the light truck uh, segment really being more and more present and um, to be more commoditized in the market. Um, we see that in kind of what I would call the B2C space, but also from a B2B perspective in how we service our dealer network and our customers, there has been um, so much more focus in the area of artificial intelligence and how we can use machine learning and AI to deliver outcomes that are predictive for our customers and to, to really help support them in this way and how we orient ourselves towards our customers. So this idea of sales and marketing kind of merging more and more together, I couldn't agree more with. Um, the other thing is, and I think this is the timing couldn't be better to, to be talking about disruption here because just the other day, I, uh, I facilitated a seminar with a company called Embrain within Continental and Embrain is a global competitor and market intelligence firm. Um, and they came to talk to us about the future of intelligence was the name of the seminar. And I just want to share with you, there was one slide that I thought um, was really 
um, made some several some some good points. So it had basically on on the top different let's say disruptors or companies that were disruptive, and on, on the bottom it had basically the value proposition that the disruptors brought. So um, it said Amazon did not kill the retail business. They did that to themselves with bad customer services. Netflix did not kill Blockbuster. They did that to themselves with their ridiculous late fees. Uber did not kill the taxi business. They did that to themselves by limiting the fare controls. Airbnb did not kill the hotel industry. They did that to themselves by limited availability and price options. And Apple Music did not kill the music industry. They did it to themselves by forcing to buy full albums. So the point was that technology, of course, is in the middle of this, but um, the technology is, it's more customer centricity that is driving the disruption than technology. So um, this is where I think this orientation towards what our customers need, driving the disruption is really, really important. And that's what Conti has been in the midst or, or really working on very actively is really understanding what the real value is that we bring to our, um, to our dealer network. And then of course, extend it to the consumer. So. So thank you, Maria. Um, so let's, let's, stay on this theme now and go to your role as a marketing leader, right? I think what we heard, uh, I'm going to kind of really summarize what we heard because we heard a lot there, but, you know, new and accelerated customer experiences, technology impacting the business, digital touch points, uh, real-time marketing, if you will. And also, I think a constant theme um, that I heard there was kind of the reframing of your competition, right? The way you think about comp competing differently. Um, those are all things that sit directly on top of marketing, right? Um, what does, wh how, how are you as a marketing leader reacting to all of this? And how are you leading your organization into competing in this uh, kind of going forward? So Maria, why don't we just come right back to you and build off what you talked about? And then we'll kind of work our way through again. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can say that for us, um, data science has become um, more and more important and more prevalent. So um, I remember a couple of years ago, which is also just sharing my, my personal story, um, uh, working very deeply in customer data, market data, competitive data. Um, I, I had been looking for, for some time to see how we can become more efficient in our approach and developing more of kind of the, the bigger picture, so what, um, in our numbers. And uh, I met and, and it was a newly installed function in Conti a couple of years ago, um, the head of the, the data science department for, for the tire division for Continental. And he presented some things um, around what they do in predictive analytics and predictive outcomes. And I thought, I wanna talk to that guy because <laughs> there are things there that could really help us uh, become more efficient. And since then we're working with that team um, to, we started doing, let's say, more internal market forecasting models, looking to see where the import, um, let's say, import market is going, because that's clearly something that has um, that has evolved in the tire industry. Um, and lately, we're using these data analytics more for customer outcomes. So, what can we do to apply this predictive modeling to help us? first of all, better understand our customers, and second of all, basically be a better partner to them through these predictive analytics. So um, it's a really, we're, we're working on some really, really cool projects. And as part of that, um, last year, I decided to bring in kind of a resident data scientist within my team. And um, in some of the research that I did, let's say, behind that, uh, I learned that the, the function of data science is one of the top five functions, let's say, or um, areas of expertise um, in the automotive world. So I think it speaks to the increasing complexity of the automotive space and how much we need, uh, let's say, functional areas like data science to, to really drive the outcomes. So kind of boil it down to what is really important for our customers. So. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Amanda, you wanna go next? 
Yeah, I'm just trying to think about how I want to answer. I saw in the chat that somebody had written about um, a question around uh, young marketers in particular and being disruptive thinkers. And I, I want to respond to that um, specifically, but, but on the broader point, uh, you know, Marisa Liston is our chief marketing officer. And I think that um, she comes from a, a very long-standing communications background and I think is, is uh, using that combined with um, a, a really collaborative leadership style um, that's very inclusive, that's like drawing in uh, energy from across the staff. And I think those two things together um, really fuel some of the, the small changes we make, like um, the tone of your social media activations, right? And, and how you're speaking with the customer, um, which in our case has gotten some, some industry press attention. Um, and then also how you work with talent, right? Which in our business is, is critical. Um, and, uh, and then you know, really moving beyond uh, speaking at the consumer to having that dialogue, right? And, um, and those are all really important things that a marketer needs to do. Um, I think that in terms of people who are starting out in their career, no matter which department they, they end up in, because uh, as we've noted, like your career can take many paths. You may be in a marketing department. You may not start in a marketing department. Uh, I've always found that if you can keep an eye out to um, really like the concentric circles that sort of happen around change. So you sort of start with like population shifts that are happening, like on the very, very macro level, you go down to your industry shifts Right, and then you look at sister sectors to you, and what uh, disruption you see happening there. That is always a really good foundational um, approach that that I've found. Uh, whether you have access to uh, data science resources on hand or you don't, it's something that you can do, um, no matter your level, and it's a good way to uh, generate ideas. I think that. Um, the approach you take once you have the idea will vary by the org, uh, but no matter what, I think that what gets noticed are people that bring smart ideas to the table um, that are very thoughtful and show uh, an understanding of, of the broader uh, factors that are impacting the company. Thank you, Amanda. Ken, um, I want to give you the floor for a few minutes. So oh. Ken, Ken's going to have to uh, leave us here at 10 o'clock. He's got a uh, Kind of a meeting that came up here in the last minute with the CEO, but maybe you can talk a little bit about this question and also your your role within the broader organization in the C-suite. Uh, these things happen, right? So I'll, uh, let, I'd like to give you a few minutes before you have to run. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more with Maria. I think the importance as far as the role of, of marketing in the, in the business and in the world that I live in, um, we really are at the center of the wheel, which is where you want marketing to be. Um, and it all begins with that data science, right? I mean, it begins with um, the data, the analytics and the insights um, that are subsequently used across the organization. Um, and so we've invested heavily in those um, inside of my organization because it really is the driver of our strategy it's the driver of and where we're going to invest, where we're going to do M&A, where we're going to find new profit pools, where we're going to find new markets to enter. It drives our, our go-to-market strategy, um, both mine from a messaging and a positioning perspective in marketing, uh, but also on the sales side. I couldn't agree with uh, more with some of the comments that were made earlier. One of the lessons that I've learned is that the sales marketing relationship has to be like that. Um, it has to be in order to be successful. I would also argue um, um, or make the comment um, that was made by, uh, by Chris. I, Chris. I think Chris spent a lot of his time in sales. Um, I find the best marketers are people that were in sales. You, it's very difficult to be a, uh, an excellent marketer if you don't know what it's like to carry a bag and be in front of the customer every day. Um, so, um, marketing really is at the center of, of the business here at Cox Automotive. And that's not always been the case in my experience. Um, and it, it's not easy to get that position or maintain that position. 
Um, and you got to have the support of, of the leadership and the, the rest of the executive team. Um, an example of that, as Jeff just alluded to, um, I was asked by our CEO of Cox Enterprises, not automotive, to join his uh, monthly operations review and give a marketing update. And that speaks to the testament of the role of marketing here at Cox and just how important it is. Um, so I'm going to have to drop off. I do want to, um, I think one question that, um, that Jeff was going to ask later on is just advice for young professionals. One thing that I learned early in my career, like I told you my first job was in events planning and I was doing media relations and things like that. Um, and I mean, it was a great way to kind of start uh, and get going uh, in the business. Um, but I was laid off. I mean, my dad had worked for the same company for 39 years. I thought once you had a job, you had it forever and you were going to be with that company. I mean, I heard Terrence say he's been in the business, but you see how he's had to jump to other, other businesses. But my dad was with the same company for 39 years in sales, which is hard to believe now that I look back on it. So when I got my first job, I thought that was where I was going to be the rest of my life. Six weeks after I started, I was laid off. <laughs> and, um, and then again, I was laid off again. Uh, two years later, when I was doing marketing communications, and both of those were at Sprint, and it was just a tumultuous time in the industry that I was in. Um, but the lesson that I learned is that I want um, all of you to um, that are coming into the business world here soon is to stay as close to the customer as possible. Um, and that is where you're going to add the most value. Um, so after those experiences that I had, I went towards product, I went towards sales, I went towards sales support and made sure that I was directly linked uh, and could draw a thread to driving results um, and um, showing how the marketing work that we were doing uh, directly impacts the bottom line. So um, stay as close to the customer and to the revenue as possible would be my, my biggest piece of advice. The other thing that I would um, offer to all of you is your degrees are are kick ass, right? But they're only gonna get you in the door. And once you're in the door, um, it's up to you to kind of take it from there. I have a son who just graduated from business school this past May and he started his career. And one of the things that I told him that he's taken to heart is he, you have got to network and you have to make friends when you don't need them. And you gotta get out there and you need to see who the movers and shakers are in the business that you've joined and, and find them and meet them, even if they're in a, a part of the organization that you're not directly related to. Um, and then the final piece of advice I would give you is um, some advice that I got from a, a mentor long ago was they asked the proverbial, hey, where do you want to be in five years? And no, you know, it's like, well, I don't know. Um, but she really made me um, think long and hard about it and made me put my career on a page. And I wanted to be a CMO um, 25 years ago or so. And I plotted out all the functions that a CMO um, typically has under their responsibility. And I used that to drive my career to go get experiences across all the disciplines that are typically under a CMO, checked all those boxes and I'm sitting in this chair. So I encourage you to take your career planning seriously um, and simplify it, work a plan. So um, Jeff, I apologize. I'm just, I mean, I, and, and I would also say to all of you, um, hopefully Jeff will let you know how to get in touch with us. I'd, I'd be happy to connect with anyone. We're hiring. The war for talent right now is, is significant and um, you all have a lot to offer. So if you're interested in coming to Atlanta and working for a privately held company that's ready to disrupt the world, give me a call. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate right. your time. We'll be back in touch. All right, sounds good. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet the panel. Terrence, you want to pick it up from there? You know, I, I will only add a couple of really brief comments because I think much of what's been said, I fully agree with. Uh, if you think about it at the macro level, what are we all trying to do? We're all trying to find ways to drive consumers uh, the right product at the right time, at the right price to the right consumer. That's what we're trying to do ultimately. And the way to do that is what's already been said, is personalization and data. Uh, and finding ways to be able to get that product to me when I have a need for it. So, so I'm a big car person. Uh, I play around with cars more than I should. 
And right now I'm looking for a set of tires for, for a car that's very unique, that's very specific. So I've been online looking for tires uh, for this car because I'm trying to figure out which brand tire I should get um, <clears throat> for what I'm looking for. And, and it's amazing now I'm getting all of these pop-up ads about offerings around tires. It's almost as if Maria knew that I was going to be looking for tires. So now she's pinging me with all of these ads and these specific, this very specific content that feels geared to me. Uh, and that's what we all have to do, regardless of your industry. We have to find ways to create that personalization and data is the way to do that. And that's already been said by the rest of the group. So I'll just keep it very brief there, uh, Jeff, on the comment. Thanks, Jerry. I've heard that Conti's are a really good brand or generals. <laughs> <laughs> You're high on my list for what I'm looking for right now. <laughs> Chris, you, Chris you, have, um, you want to add to that question before we move on to the next chapter? Yeah, I'll just add a, a few quick things. I, I really uh, appreciate a lot of Ken's comments. You know, learn marketing, learn sales. They're converging. They're working together. And I know that's not the exact question, but I agreed completely with that. I agree with so much of what was said. I will say this, there's different companies and marketing plays a different role at different companies. A lot of times a consumer packaged goods company, marketing is that center of the hub and drives the process. If you're looking at uh, digital world, marketing is not really involved in product development. I think to be the complete marketer, you need from cradle to grave. Um, that's my recommendation and I surely agree. Marketing and sales might not be the highest job coming out of college, but it's where the advancement goes. And I think you go further in your career with the marketing and sales experience because at the end of the day, marketing and sales are really the only two, uh, two divisions that bring in revenue to a company, okay? But I will talk about uh, how things have changed, right? And it goes back to what Terrence was saying about customization, about personalization, right? Fisher Price used to be massive. We'd have to put products on shelves. We'd rely on that. Now, to appeal to different segments, we could introduce toys that weren't, we didn't need shelf space. We could sell it ourselves and introduce things that were timely and kind of enhanced our brand. So I'll give you two examples of that, right? Just this week, uh, Fisher Price introduced, and I'm holding that up. You guys all remember that toy, right? This is now a cell phone. This is a cell phone that you can put on your desk and it connects digitally to your cell phone so you can talk on this, right? That is disrupting the marketplace and a ton of PR on this and it sold out in the first day, right? Little people, right? We all grew up with little people. We would have never in the start of my career done something like this, but this is the Rolling Stone little people, right? Collectible, we can market ourselves. Little tribute to the Rolling Stones and Charlie Watt, uh, bless his soul. And uh, digital and personalization have allowed things like these to happen where mass distribution would have not. All right. So that's uh, how the marketing world has changed. Thank you, Chris. Um, let's completely shift topics right now just to break it up a little bit. Um, and I think one of the things too, that with remember the bulk of our audience today at, is, you know, early twenties, yeah, they're, they're saying they're looking at a panel of seasoned veterans, if you will. And um, take us back to when you were at, at USC and a moment that you remember professionally. I know you, you may have met a spouse. You may, I'm sure you had a lot of fun. We've got the five point stories, all that. But something you remember from your time here that had an impact on you professionally that you still remember today. And since this wasn't a, a question I had had given you, you know, or, or or prepped you with, I'll let whoever whoever wants to go first can jump in here. Um, I'll I'll start. I had no professional moments here at USC, so I'm going to pass it along. No, I'm I'm kidding. Um, I did talk about one up front, like a professor that had uh, real world, real world work experience um, brought what happened in the, uh, you know, in the corporate world to the classroom. And that inspired me to to one day be where I am. So that had a profound effect on on me. The other thing I would say is um, networking. Right. Um, started networking with uh People, uh, one of my friends in my fraternity, his father was a VP at Xerox. 
um, and I'd arranged some interviews with Xerox um, to through him. I ended up going with a competitor because uh, I found out during my experience and research on uh, Xerox that Kodak was a competitor. So I reached out to some people I knew there and ended up going with Kodak. But it's never too uh, early to start networking. Your, you know, your friends, parents all have parents, and those parents, most of them probably have jobs and connections. Uh, utilize that network to figure out your first steps and then utilize your alumni network. We're all here for you. I know that anyone on this phone would be happy to talk to you because they're connected to this university. So that's me. Thanks, Chris. Who wants to jump in next? Hey, I'll, I'll throw in a thought. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I hated um, during my, my days in the business school was group projects. And because I've always operated under this premise that I, you know, I've got to be accountable for me. I can drive my actions. I can drive, you know, so I, I, that's how I thought about the world when I was 19 or 20 or whatever. Um, but one of the things that I grew to appreciate about those experiences after I entered the professional world, rarely are you solely accountable. Rarely do you have, are you going to be the one in the boat alone with an oar trying to get to the shore? You're, you literally have to work and engage with a team, with partners, with peers, with colleagues. So finding ways to work in tandem uh, and in partnership with others is essential. We've alluded to this earlier through various comments around how sales, marketing, I'm going to throw a product in there, at least for my industry, uh, but product, sales, marketing all work together to drive solutions um, out to the end consumer overall. So if I didn't know how to work with my colleagues or my peers, I wouldn't get anything done. I wouldn't be able to accomplish anything. And like I said, I, you know, I, back in the day when I was, you know, we'll call it immature, um, you know, I, I didn't like that, but it's something that I learned how to do. Uh, and I, I'd like to say that I, I was introduced to that concept at least of learning and understanding how to do that during my days at USC. Great. I have something I want to share. Oops. Go ahead, Maria. You want to go? No, go ahead. No, yeah, okay. Mine, it just came to my mind, uh, Jeff, when you were asking, and this is actually kind of an, um, uh, an irony in a way. So I remember my last day in MIBS in 2001, I had uh, Dr. Shemp as my integrated marketing communications professor who is still in my heart, such a wonderful professor and um, kind of mentored the students um, in, in different areas. And um, <laughs> I remember he gave this, this talk to us, it was our last day and he said, don't forget how important happiness is. And he shared this story about the Mexican fishermen and the Harvard MBA. I don't know how many of you all have heard that um, or not, but it was really about how um, important it is to remember kind of holistically as you embark on your career. This was his message to us, how, how important it is to keep your orientation around being kind of happy as a person. And this was 20 years ago. So this year is the 20 year anniversary for uh, our MIBS class. And I know that, um, so I'm a mother of three kids. I have a 10 year old, a seven year old and a five year old. And those of you that were in these networking sessions on, on uh, Wednesday, you heard a little bit about that. And I have pivoted in my career and actually in some cases foregone promotions because I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to be an executive, but I also wanted to be a good mom. And, um, so I've foregone and, and I'm, I'm really happy that I did that. I don't regret any of that because I was still able to reach um, where I am today, which is a really, really good place. Um, but then fast forwarding to this year, I was part of this leadership development program uh, at Continental. It's one of the, let's say one of the highest leadership development programs. And uh, there was an entire day, entire day, this was leadership development for executives and senior executives that was dedicated to happiness. And the whole thing around it was, if you're happy intrinsically as a person, then you will also be an effective leader. So 
I, I couldn't believe it. I was sitting there and, and they told the Mexican fisherman story. You guys should look it up. There's no time here to share it, but um, they told the same story. And I thought this is really an irony of sorts and come kind of comes full circle. So 20 years later, I'm sitting here listening to the same story and um, with such a focus on happiness. So I also want to say um, that was something that, that, I, that I carried with me the entire time, um, kind of a, a learning out of my schooling. And it really is kind of an evergreen message, no matter how our industry evolves and all of that. I think um, it's kind of a leadership dimension is keep your orientation around what makes you happy. So um, that's great. Great, Maria. Thanks for sharing that. Go ahead, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, good advice from from across the panel. Um, I would say to the students, you know, one thing just to reassure you is I, I think that the, these kinds of moments are never, most of the time are not going to feel like moments when you're experiencing them, right? Like you have the benefit of hindsight looking back um, and you connect dots that maybe you didn't know were going to materialize. So to give two examples of that, uh, I had a creative writing professor. Um, that was the first time that um, someone really invested in the idea that my writing had a voice and gave me a lot of, of confidence. Um, and that's something that's carried me up through my job today. I mean, really what you're seeing is uh, the rise of the, the data translator. And I would say number one job that I have is to tell the story, right? Of what is the data telling us? And then how does the business need to respond to that? Um, and so I draw on uh, things that I learned even back in school to do that. The other um, is more of just a, a personal uh, thing that, that it just shows how crazy life can be is that uh, I took a film studies class. It was um, in the media studies department. Um, we watched a bunch of movies in that class and one of them was Apocalypse Now. It was the first time I ever saw Apocalypse Now and it was on like this terrible television and, uh, and I was blown away and uh, it became one of my favorite movies. And, uh, you know, I had no idea that five years later, right, like I would be sitting with Coppola, right, like talking about working on a version of that film, right? So um, th those moments... Uh, you know, you look back and you see you see the path that got you there, but it's as I was saying earlier, it's rarely straight. So, uh, so don't put too much pressure on yourself that you have to have like a big moment. You'll you'll realize you did later. Excellent, thank you guys off the off the cuff. That was great, uh, and I think inspirational for a lot of us, and, and particularly for our students. Um, I, I wanted to let's just keep the the pace going here a little bit, and I want to do a kind of a quick word association kind of a round table. So you can keep it to a sentence or two. That'd be great. I'm just going to give you a word or a couple words and just tell me what that means to you um, and, and how we go. Amanda, you're, you're, I'm looking at you. So I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, insights. Yeah, they are valuable if they are clear and actionable. Terrence. I'd say, how do you ensure that you know my needs before I ask? Yeah. Uh, Chris. All right. So I, I think uh, information is a piece of the puzzle. And when information is placed correctly with other pieces of information and data, and you add more pieces of information from different areas, those pieces of the puzzle form a picture. And that picture then sets a strategic direction. So that be, those pictures, those pieces become insights and those insights lead to strategy. That's right. Maria. Yeah, I mean, insights is kind of at the tail end of it. I mean, you have data, you have information, you have knowledge. And then if you're really good, you're able to deliver insights that drive action. So. How about marketing technology? Uh, Maria. Whew. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the word that, that comes to mind is evolution. So it's always changing. That's at least my vantage point. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it went from um, content management in drives and all of that. Now we're looking at platforms. We're looking at kind of the constant interaction. So 
Um, it's this evolution and it's still changing. I mean, we have evolved a, a lot in this area, but it's really going more towards this uh, interactivity and kind of continuous feedback to the customer rather than the more traditional approach that we've had in the past. So it's an, in, it's an enabler in many ways, going back to the sales marketing connection. Terrence. Uh, the one word that comes to mind for me when you throw out, you know, uh, marketing technology is essential. <laughs> um, and it's essential because it ties everything we've been talking about for the last hour or so together. When, when you talk about data, uh, innovation, creativity, personalization, meeting my needs, meeting me where, uh, meeting the customer where they are, all those things relate to our ability to, to use technology to do that. Uh, when I was CMO Nationwide, I, I increased my, our MarTech budget by significant sums of money over a four-year window. Uh, we, we went from, from not even understanding the word MarTech and what it meant to spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a system that really allowed me to drive that personalization that I've been referring to and that attribution that is so important to a marketer. Uh, because you know, spending a dollar means how do I understand what the return linked to that dollar is? And to me, MarTech allows me to do that. Essential. Great. Amanda. Oh, I would say um, I'll be a little bit contrarian, but but it will sound more contrarian than I am, uh, than I mean it to be, uh, which is that I, I actually would say that the marketing technology and the data support the strategy of the business. And the reason I would say that is only because the, the technology that you build, right, is responsive to the problems you're trying to solve and the data you acquire will inherently have gaps and biases in it, right? And so part of the lens that you work through, it's it's like from both perspectives, right? The, the data and the tech inform the strategy, um, but they also are informed by the strategy. And so uh, it's, it's being aware of both the value and the limitations of that. And uh, that's why we, we still have us humans to, to interpret, right? And, and reason through. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. So I heard Maria mention uh, artificial intelligence in one of her uh, speeches. I always thought that was just me trying to pretend I was smart. But uh, then I looked it up and artificial intelligence is coming into the, the marketing world is something we need to be aware of. But, uh, you know, marketing technology has really transformed uh, marketing into an area that can be real time, right? It has made marketing personalized, and that's where the technology and the trends are going. And I look at, uh, you know, Jeff, I think you said one of the things like, hey, what book would you recommend? I would recommend, uh, you know, How to Win Friends and Influence People, because when you look at kind of the top things to make people like you, all those rules apply in the personal world, but also pretty much in the digital world. So digital is now... Marketing is real time and more important than ever. Okay. Well, why don't we why don't we take that as a, a segue? Um, when it comes to recommendations from you guys for our students in terms of something to read, that's a question that I get a lot. A book that I'd recommend, a podcast, uh, somebody to follow. Uh, Chris just teed that up nicely. The rest of you, any recommendations for our students? Who do you go to to in, for inspiration or or to stay on on top of things? Terrence, you want to give your thoughts first? Uh, I will. Um, in light of, of, of current events and, and what happened earlier this week, one of we lost one of my, my personal heroes. Uh, retired General Colin Powell is someone that we lost uh, on Monday earlier this week. And he is someone who has been a hero to me literally my entire career. In fact, uh, for time, I won't go into this long story. But in 1996, when he was contemplating running for president, uh, I was literally early in my career. I'd been in the work industry for six years at that point. And I actually was contemplating taking a leave of absence, literally, to work his campaign uh, if he'd made the decision to run. That's how kind of infatuated I was with him as a leader, as a person uh, at that time. So he is someone who I've, I've leaned on. And I, I've read all of his books. I've, I've read every, I've seen every speech he's ever made. Oh, that's probably to be too generous. Um, so I would encourage you to, to Google his speeches, to Google his books, uh, look for ways to understand his style, his approach, his thoughts around leadership. One of his books, uh, it, it worked for me. He outlines his, his steps of leadership. And I've read it eons ago. I'm rereading it right now just in, in 
memory of him and recognizing him. Uh, so that's what I would, that would be my one recommendation to you. Just, we, we lost a true American hero this week and there are learnings that he left with us that can be garnered by all of us. Thank you, Ter Terrence, for sharing that. Um, Amanda. Yeah, um, I would encourage the students to read voraciously. Um, you may not always be, right, like the highest titled person in the room, but you can always be the best, like most, most well-read person in the room and that always comes through. Um, so I generally am trying to read like one to two books a week. Um, so I would encourage, you know, even if you're, you're podcasting it, like just really, uh, consume, uh, but for a book, I would say, uh, one good one, uh, particularly for the students would be switch by Chip Heath and Dan Heath, uh, subtitle is how to change things when change is hard. Um, it's good practical advice. And it is not written for the CEO, right? It's written for anyone that is trying to make change at any level of any organization. Maria? I'm writing these titles down because I wanna do some more reading. So <laughs> that's really good. Um, so a couple of ones, one that I love and it actually was circulated internally is called The First 90 Days. I don't know how many of you have, have heard of it. It's a fantastic book. And yes, I um, it's very funny. I, I read that book uh, at some point um, uh, some time ago and I reread it. I go back and reference it. And then our CEO for the Americas moved on to uh, a global role. This was a few years back. And I, I gifted him with that book. And he was so grateful. I mean, it's a book for no matter where you are in your career, um, it gives some really great advice. A lot of this stuff, honestly, we've talked about here, this idea of building relationships, going out and finding your alliances within companies. Um, you, The whole idea for the book is that you kind of have around 90 days where companies are giving you a carte blanche, right? To to go out there, you ask any question you want and, 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 and meet people. So this, this book, um, uh, I would really recommend. It's fantastic. Um, I do have one more that I, I absolutely was so inspired when I heard this guy, I heard him live. His name is Brendan Hall. Write this down and I'll also put it in the chat. I don't know if you all have heard of him, but he's a very, um, he's basically a skipper. Um, who, ha who has led this uh, team of people through uh, journeys around the world um, in, in a yacht. And the name of the book is called Team Spirit. Um, and it's life and leadership on one of the toughest yacht races. So look it up. It's fantastic. It talks about leadership and how important it is to, let's say, give to other people the leadership um, skills or kind of the, the knowledge that you have so that one day they can, they can um, let's say, replace you and, and kind of um, uh, build on, on your leadership. So both of those are really good. First 90 days and team spirit. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to bring this home now. This was a, a question that uh, was asked in the chat a little while ago, and, and I'll come back to it. Ken alluded to it. But um, you guys have teams that work for you, uh, your companies and, and certainly your groups are, are likely looking for young talent. Um, as you're, as you're thinking about our audience here, uh, what advice would you have for them as they transition from their academic career into their professional career? What do you look for in young marketers and any, any advice related to how to build disruptive thinking skills? Because uh, I think one of the things we've heard from all of you over the last hour plus is that disruption, I think Terrence, you said this is not going away, it's here to stay. And the pace of change uh, is here to stay. And so what, what skills do you look for? What advice would you give them? Um, and I know it means a lot to them to, to hear this from you guys. So um, you, uh, Chris, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um... You know, from a what skills people look for, I always looked for, would they fit on my team? Would they fit in with my culture? And as, I, as you uh, young professionals are going about your career, I'll, I'll give you this advice. An interview is a two-way communication, but it's also a two-way decision. 
interview your manager, make sure you fit with your manager. You may be interviewing with a great company, but if you have a bad manager, it will not be a good job and vice versa. All right. So make sure it's a two way street in the interview process. Uh, I also make sure that the person is genuine. I make sure that they can sell themselves because when you get into any job, it is going to be about being able to sell your idea. If you're in advertising, you're going to be selling your communication. You're going to be selling your campaigns. If any job is, you have to sell things. And I look for people that can sell me on themselves. So understand yourselves. Um, early in your career, treat your career like your university. You took different classes to acquire different skills. In the world, this disruption, the more skills you have, the more marketable you are long term. So take sales roles, take different roles. If you're not feeling uncomfortable, you're not learning and you are not developing. So learning different roles and responsibilities makes you more marketable internally and externally. So keep developing your skills, keep pushing yourself and you will have a rewarding and successful career. Thank you, Chris. That's great. Amanda? Oh, there's so many. Um, I would say, first and foremost, to focus on value creation and outcomes versus actions and responsibilities. I think it's very easy for us to just talk about the work we do, but really what you want to focus on is like what that then contributed to. Um, and there are ways to do that uh, at any level. So that's not something that's restricted to, to the leader of an organization. Um, on a personal level, I would say always challenge your first reaction, particularly like the faster you have it, like give yourself a beat to really reconsider, right? What you might not be thinking of and uh, court uh, people who compliment your unique skills and viewpoints um, because you'll really find strength in that partnership. Um, in terms of developing a subject matter expertise, I think what you'll find across um, most of us is that you can really chart between someone's identities and their interests and how it led them to where they are. And I think a lot of us spend a lot of time like fighting those or not valuing them. And the earlier you can do that, uh, the better it is. Um, I would say, don't worry about where it's all going. You don't need to know what you're going to do in 20 years. I don't know what I'm going to be doing in 20 years, right? Like the world is changing too much for that. So I think if you could figure out five, you're in great shape um, and that's long enough. And then lastly, on a practical tip, I, I'm working with a coach that is having me create a networking list of a thousand people, which is a pain to do. But I will say it is something that I would recommend to anybody. Um, it will stretch you to think well outside of the normal frameworks you might give and that and it can be a lifelong uh, pursuit. Awesome. Thank you, Maria. I love that network list of a thousand. So I would say, I mean, you, you might think in the world of data analytics, AI, all this stuff that we talked about that I might have let's say a team of people working for me that are sitting behind a computer and you know there's smoke coming out of the computer and working with R and Python and all these different programs. But no, I mean, if there is anything that I would want you all to walk away with is that it is all about people and relationships and testing for outcomes. So especially in a space where when we started this predictive modeling um, approach that I referenced earlier, it would have been very easy to kind of take it so far down the path and try to work on a polished, finished project product, right? Before we went to our executives with it. And um, I think part of the success was that we worked in these kind of small modules, right? So you basically build it out and then you test it. You go look for a customer or you kind of verify your ideas with people that know more than you, you know? So. Um, if I could say anything is please, please stay connected with people, no matter what kind of function you're in. If you're working on something new, take a pause, go have a conversation with somebody, ideally somebody who's a stakeholder in what you're working on, and then come back and iterate. And that is really the most effective way that I have found to really be successful because you will, you will always have the, the customer in the middle of what you're doing if you do it that way and you build strong relationships. Thank you, Maria. All right. 
Uh, I know we've had a number of people join us since we uh, we started this, and I referenced at the beginning that uh, the very first keynote at the very first CMO Summit was given by Terrence. So Terrence, I'm going to give you the final word on this session uh, in terms of advice for our students. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, my, my fellow panelists have really said so many of the things that were swirling in my head. So I'm going to try to kind of create a synopsis of, of how I think about this, at least. And it'll touch on just a few points that I've heard from, from several folks here. Um, you know, when I think about what I want and look for in someone that we're bringing into the organization, I, I want someone that can, can clearly articulate or prove to me that they're adaptive, that they can evolve constantly and figure out how to fit into to different places within the organization. I want someone who's, who can demonstrate that they're curious. They're always trying to, they're inquisitive, not for inquisitive sake, obviously, but they're inquisitive or curious through this lens of trying to find ways to make things better. Uh, they can demonstrate that they're innovative in their thinking, their approach, their creative. And all of that really means what I think Amanda said really well, value creation. How do you use all of these things to create, uh, to create value regardless of your role? Um, and, and the last point I would share, two points, is A, you don't have to have all the answers. Um, you know, although I, I know what I'll be doing in 20 years, I'll be on a beach in Sarasota, Florida, but most of you don't know what you'll be doing in 20 years. And it's okay uh, to figure that out as you go. You don't have to have all of the answers uh, right now. But the, the most important thing I would leave you with is commit yourself to being a lifelong learner. Commit yourself to being someone who's always going to absorb take it in, evaluate, assess, uh, and be able to kind of push that back out through your lens of how you communicate. That would be the, the single most important thing that I would share with you that I was given that counsel and advice as a young leader. And it's something that I've always tried to uh, exemplify in my career, so. Thank you, Terrence, very much. And I think that's, that is a great way to wrap up this discussion, which has been fantastic, is, you know, be a lifelong learner, find ways to create value. We had a young lady in our young alumni panel yesterday say, you don't need to be perfect. Uh, embrace the fact you're different and, and be able to sell yourself, which I think Chris talked about, right? That companies want, when you're interviewing, companies want to be able, can you, if you can't sell yourself, how are you going to market or sell something else, right? So be confident, do it with conviction, continue to learn, create value. I mean, that's great advice, guys. This was, this was so good. And, and Terrence, this will show you a little bit how far the summit has come. We're going to We've, so you guys know, full disclosure, we've recorded this um, and we're going to create little video of each kind of topic area, little videos that we can share in our classes. So this is going to live over the course of the year until the next summit in other ways beyond just what we did this morning. Uh, there, it will not be on YouTube. We're not going to publish it. You're not going to be out uh, on, uh, in the media, but we are going to continue to use the advice you shared with us with your with our students across different classes, et cetera. So thank you so much for your time this morning. Amanda, thank you for getting up at 5 a.m. Uh, to be here with us. Um, and you guys have a great day. Logistically, for those that are staying for the next session, it'll start at 11 o'clock. You're welcome to stay in the room. Um, we're gonna kind of just make everything quiet here for a little while, uh, take a break, catch our breath. But I hope everybody can join us to see Joe from Chick-fil-A at, at 11 o'clock. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.